All right, so I just have uh, five slides, so it should only be maybe 45, 50 minutes. <laughs> uh, so, I, um, so it's a little bit about the, the breakout session yesterday on, in, in pharmacogenomics. And uh, uh, Alan Schuldener wasn't, uh, wasn't here, um, but this is on behalf of the, the group that met, including um, uh, the three that are, are, uh, have some responsibility. Uh, this is, was our, our charge from, from last December. Uh, identifying one or more collaborative demonstration projects that would advance implementation of pharmacogenomics into clinical practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'll, I'll mention briefly one of them in the next slide. Um, but very little time was spent on that, um, mainly because the RFA is out. Uh, people are already thinking about those actual projects from the past discussion. And, you know, if, if you haven't started thinking about it now, it's kind of too late. So um, it's, uh, there, there wasn't a lot of time spent on, on this part of, of the charge. Now, this is a slide from Alan. I'm not sure exactly what it says, so I'll just talk and not even look at it. Uh, but basically, one of the one of the things that is is uh, coming out of of uh, the last uh, the, the last efforts um, is this uh, collaboration that has been heavily driven by the Pharmacogenetic Research Network, um, where uh, many of the the PGRN investigators, including uh, Julie, uh, Dan, um, others who are probably here that I'm not seeing at the moment, um, have been involved in getting their uh, version of the, the must-have genetic variants. Debbie Nickerson, who was here yesterday, is involved in putting together that platform. Um, and there's a, a um, this, this uh, custom drive panel, uh, the, the the VIPGX or PGRN-seq or whatever it ends up being called uh, will be applied um, probably across some of the eMERGE network sites, which also is heavily represented here in the, in the room. And so the, the idea that a, uh, a, a more focused uh, 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 a platform for looking at pharmacogenetic variants can be tested in, the, in a, a broad population, looking at what is the incidence of these variants, looking at some of the initial association with outcome is, is part of the idea that's coming forward. And this is mainly driven because uh, many of the off-the-shelf platforms do not do a great job. Um, many of the off-the-shelf uh, whole exome next-gen sequencing type platforms do not do a good job when it comes to pharmacogenomics. And I think you know, many of us have had experience uh, using the, uh, the several of the different next-gen platforms, fantastic coverage except for CYP2D6 and 3A, uh, the 3A family, and some of these other regions where there's a lot of pseudogenes, high homology, and those kind of issues. And so uh, one part of that is really trying to tackle this. Now, I think that some of this, the um, off-the-shelf, if you want to use that term, uh, uh, tools that are, that are coming out now are starting to overcome this issue. There's also other labs uh, that, are, that are doing, have their own custom version of this that seem to give very good coverage. So I think this is a problem that technically is being solved, but uh, where this comes in is really jumping the hurdle towards uh, doing a, a broader application, uh, taking these platforms and trying to think about, you know, what is the instance? You know, when I talk to, I, I love that Pearl was, had a, such a primary care focus to a lot of what she was just talking about. because. When I talk to family members who are in, in the primary care area, or, or collaborators for that ma matter, um, first of all, they want to know just in time, um, but they, they also want to know what they want to know what what are the areas where they should care. It's it's really kind of what is the minimum amount of information that can be delivered as late as possible, um, and I think some of the the work that's that's happening here will will help identify things like how many patients actually have these variants? You know, is this a, a one in a lifetime experience or every other patient? And I, mean, I don't know if Josh Jenny's still here, uh, but uh, jo yeah, right there, there he is. Uh, yeah, you're a pair, yeah, congratulations. Um, so I, I know you got a paper uh, that'll be coming out sometime soon, the editor of, of the journal's back there, so maybe I shouldn't say anything, it's probably embargoed. Um, but um, just looking at, well, what, is, what are the frequency of some of these variants? <laughs> so some of the, what are the frequency of some of these variants in a Vanderbilt uh, medical home? Um, and it actually occurs in a lot of people, and it's, a, it's, it's not this rare event. And uh, I think some of that, uh, some of what's coming out of this pharmacogenomics working group are getting some of the simple descriptive proof of principle that would cause a generalist, whether they're an internist, family medicine, pediatrics, to realize that they, they might actually care someday. Um, and they can wait until they have to care, but they, they at least might care someday. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll stop rambling about that. The other thing is we, we spent a lot of time on, on um, non-RFA issues um, because, uh, because of the reasons I already said. And one of them was around the areas of publication. And so one of the things that really came out somewhat from, from Ned's talk yesterday and from also general discussion is this, this idea that 
Uh, in pharmacogenomics, there are elements that are not usually included in genetic uh, assessment, uh, assessment analyses, and we, we talked some about that. I mean, it's not just EGAP. It's, it's, uh, it's really across the, the board with, I guess, one of the exceptions being uh, Mary CPIC program. Uh, but the, uh, the idea of going and looking at uh, across these, doing kind of a, Mark uh, called it a meta-meta-analysis, a, a meta-analysis of the meta-analysis, it's not really that. What it is is basically assessing the different assessments and saying, well, what are some of the categories of information that are consistently missing um, and try to inform the, the assessment community about those because there are just a small number of categories, things like dose or concomitant medication, that if the, the EGAPs and others knew about them, they would become part of the normal process um, and would um, allow the interpretation of the pharmacogenetic component to be a bit clear. The, you know, the answer still may, may be that they're completely useless, the, the, the tests, not the assessors. Um, but the, um, the idea that we can uh, do this and have a, 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 an outcome that would uh, cause people to maybe be disgruntled but not have a good reason uh, would be uh, would ideal. Because you know, right now you get a lot of feedback um, about disgruntled and they, and they use this as an excuse. Um, it would be nice to uh, go through that. The, the other, um, and really so we can just define some of the rules to aid these, these groups. The second is, is looking at some of the advantages and disadvantages of the current platforms for pharmacogenetics. And there, there, are, um, there are a number of platforms out there. This is something maybe done best with the sequencing group. Uh, there are a number of platforms out there, and we're starting to learn a lot uh, about the nuances of where they're useful and where they're not. And there are a lot of uh, general laboratorians um, who maybe do molecular diagnostics, but also do a bunch of other stuff at the mid to small uh, size centers that are starting to get into the space. They're taking off the shelf products and hoping, you know, doing the best they can. Now, maybe the, the point should be they shouldn't do that, um, but they're doing it anyway. And so we could come up with some output that would um, help put them into context um, because there are, there are some major differences across these platforms when you get to the practical side of, of that. And we, we talked a lot, um, Hausen was, was, um, uh, was, was kind enough to, to join our group um, and get all the glorious benefits of being in our group um, last night. Uh, we had the, you know, the free car and the, the, uh, all that, all the booze. Um, uh, and and uh, really was highlighting some of, of uh, you know, what's going on at LabCorp where they have kind of every platform possible and have to figure out which one to use in each case. Um, and and many, uh, many times that is the, the situation. The, the um, last thing is that um, amongst, uh, amongst the different genetic areas, uh, there, there often is a, a, uh, a single or a small number of, of sugar daddies uh, that are pushing a particular uh, area. Um, it might be inherited metabolic disease, it might be in cardiology, et cetera. But in pharmacogenomics, there, there really isn't a, a body that way. And if you expand it further and look at, at imaging, um, imaging happened rapidly um, because there were two bodies that were involved. One was the manufacturers making sure that everyone was trained up on how to use the latest scanner, had access to it, had experience to it. And the second was the, the radiology is a discipline that exists. It's a, dependent, it's a discipline that's depended on to translate complexity into simplicity. Um, and genetics does not have that, that uh, in, in most centers. Um, and so this, this idea of trying to um, really look through who, who should be pushing this, including uh, trying to, to um, engage the payers a little bit more. Because when it comes down to it, the payers are the ones who are likely to benefit first, even before the patient, um, in, in uh, many of the things we were talking about. And then lastly, um, we, we really highlighted some of the endpoints uh, that we were interested in academically. And they often don't match what uh, insurance companies care about and certainly don't match what even our own clinical leadership might care about within our institution. Um, you know, it was, wasn't until meeting with our CEO that I realized how important uh, bounce back in the first 30 days was. That was not an endpoint on my radar. It is now. Um, uh, the, you know, a half a day of, of uh, delayed discharge for because ad inadequate pain control, huge deal. And also, um, I think it was um, visiting some of the folks at Cincinnati. One of their colleagues is an anesthesiologist, and he mentioned that uh, 22 minutes in the recovery room was equal to $1,500. Um, and, uh, you know, minutes matter in, in, uh, in that context. So, so um, we, we had talked about uh, going amongst the institutions involved at this, 
uh, either at this meeting or just with that committee, and starting to define those endpoints better and getting them out in the public domain because certainly most pharmacogeneticists are looking at academic endpoints and uh, because that's what study sections recognize. Um, but often they're endpoints that are, are really not very useful uh, to the people downstream who need to be using it. Um, and then I'm going to end with this slide of Rex's barriers for genomic medicine. Uh, these are basically copied down from uh, your slide uh, yesterday, Rex. Um, and, and just highlighting this point that many of these things on here are not primary endpoints to our academic studies. And part of that is a education of study sections and, and selection of study section uh, members. Um, but, you know, if you really right now wanted to go for funding around areas that really matter, it's very hard to get this funding in any of the study sections that I've been on. And those of us that are on council, when we think about the fights that would happen at council with some of the people who aren't in this room right now um, because they don't care about things this far downstream, they would be immense. And so there is a challenge both in terms of academic, academics and the process at NIH in terms of trying to really tackle this. And then I'll, I'll stop and, and take questions. Okay. Rex, you first. <laughs> <laughs> you going to argue with the last slide? No. Okay. It was so, literally his slide. I, I, mean, I just so Mark, it down. So Mark, Mark is going to argue with the last slide. Yeah. No, actually, I'm going to uh, uh, say uh, th th this is something that I think we'll be coming back to tw uh, towards the end of the meeting in terms of this whole issue of what are the outcomes that we need to be looking at. And I think that's a really important uh, point, and I'm glad that it, it arose in, a, in, a, in another setting than in the planning committee setting. I think the other thing, um, you know, we've been focused a lot on payers, but, it, uh, you know, the point that you made about going to your institutional leadership, it's important not only from the perspective of um, of them as your institution, but also remember the fact that the people that really will benefit from making breakthroughs here are the employers because um, they will benefit not only from uh, reduced uh, health care insurance premiums, but they also are, have to deal with absenteeism, presenteeism, uh, all these sorts of issues that affect worker productivity. And in the studies that have been done looking at self-insured plans uh, by ComEd here in uh, Chicago and Illinois, um, their return on investment for things that work is about five to six dollars for every dollar invested. And so I think that's another community that um, we should think about when we think about payers is uh, because almost every large company is self-insured. So they are in fact their own insurance company and they, has, they stand to benefit and some of them are very interested in exploring um, new, new ways to, uh, to do care. Well, the, the Medco studies that we've seen so far have all been paid for by employers, not by Medco. Uh, they, they get all the credit, but they get, you know, the employers to pay for it and because they believe there's something there. Okay. Mark. Can I, I don't know. <coughs> um, I want to comment on Rex's slide. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That, that, no, and, thank you. And that is that um, given the definition of genomic medicine that Terry presented yesterday, that, in other words, um, using that information, uh, genomic information in direct patient care. Um, that, those barriers all make sense. I think other people have a broader definition of genomic medicine, and if in that case one of the things that's missing would go right up at the top, and that is lack of information about the underlying bi biology of disease and the ability to use that information to design better therapeutics, better strategies. For, so I, um, I, I think from at least my I'm, point I'm, of view that when really we, we talk about that. implementing genomic medicine, I think we really need to be very clear that we're all agreeing on yeah. the same definition because I think a lot of the issues that uh, uh, the disagreements that come about are probably this definitional basis. No, I think, I think that's a good point, Mark, and I think the, you know, certainly I wasn't trying to, uh, my apologies, Rex, I wasn't trying to get in trouble. Um, I use this as I, I just kind of, problem, yeah, <laughs> I was just trying to uh, anchor with the, with the, uh, the, the kickoff of the conference, but the, the um, you know, the way, the way the slide from you and Eric's paper is, it, it's those five boxes, um, the graphic artists try to make them a continuum, you know, and, and if we end up with people working in each of those boxes, we really haven't gone forward. <laughs> We need to be have people working across those boxes, and and that's the that's the challenge. Is that as humans we like to be in a box for some reason, um, and uh, we we need to be looking across there. And so, 
Um, if we don't have good discovery, if we don't have good validation, including in some of these clinical trial samples, uh, if we don't have biologic plausibility at the least, if, if not actual mechanism, um, then you're, you're right. We, we can't drive this forward. And we can't get any extra added value from it. I just want to add to that. I, I mean, uh, Mark and I have talked, and, and I'm used to being in I'm, I'm used to being in trouble, so no problem there. <laughs> but you know, one of the things that strikes me that we don't emphasize enough to build on Mark's point is, you know, all of these variants of unknown significance that we see in these sequencing projects are likely to be highly informative in terms of the biology at some point. And so we really need to be making sure, we're not just moving, you know, left to right in that diagram. We need to be moving right to left in that diagram as well. So I think there's a really important opportunity for us to figure out how, and we've emphasized at this meeting a lot, the need to capture these variants of unknown significance the, and then feed them back into the biology. So I think that's a really important point. Right. Thanks. Okay. Julie, and then... So, so, Howard, the one thing that um, you didn't raise that I think we talked about and that Mary tried to um, bring up yesterday is that the idea that pharmacogenetics is a bit different than the disease genetic stuff and that, for example, putting a group of, um, a group of genetic data into a medical record as it relates to pharmacogenetics, none of the actionable variants for which really are associated with disease is probably not going to have the risk of leading to, um, you know, additional diagnostic tests and workup. And so it really does seem like a better starting place to begin to get things into the record in a preemptive way um, because it's very unlikely to kind of have that extra workup, sort of downside potential negatives right, right. Um, be because they really, you know, they really are specific to, to drug response. Well, well, thank you very much for that. I put that X down at this uh, bullet here uh, because I knew I forgot some stuff, but I, but, and I was hoping that people would fill in the, the, uh, the X. So thank you very much. Yes, that we so, did have that discussion. Scott and then, and then John. Yes. <clears throat> so I just wanted to briefly explore your concept that some of your favorite sites in the genome are not accessed well with, say, exome, yeah. but that they will be accessed well with targeted genotyping platforms. So, I mean, if you think about it, you mentioned processed pseudogenes and maybe repetitive difficult areas. I mean, some of the reasons why mapping might fail in an exome study or why capture might fail, I would think would give you trouble in some of these targeted genotyping platforms as well because they involved oligonucleotides. Some of the cheapest platforms are done on whole genomic DNA. Yeah. Well, I think the – so I would, I would look to someone else to um, – give the details about the specific out, output that Debbie and others have, have generated. But I, th I think the difference has been uh, the use of a general algorithm across the entire genome versus almost handcrafting uh, the, the, um, the probes used for the selection tool um, f for, for these approaches. So one can get around these pseudogenes if you design the, the probes appropriately. Um, but if you use just a general genome-wide uh, uh, analysis or, or probe generation strategy, um, you, you end up falling into trouble. And so they're, they're all solvable areas, but not if you, you uh, don't take into account uh, the, the pseudogenes and such. So the... But presumably you could give that feedback to the manufacturers oh, yes, of exomes yeah. and... Yeah, yeah I, don't, um, I, don't, I don't know what platform. I assume it's an Illumina platform that, that Debbie's using. She tends to, tends to go that way. Um, but um, it's not like some magical new method is being invented. It's, it's just um, the selection tools are... are um, more carefully crafted for this specific indication. So I didn't mean to overstate it as some amazing new breakthrough that we're all going to want to run out and buy stock in or sell John? stock in. <laughs> John? Uh, is it still the uh, orientation of the pharmacogenomics group that you have the opportunity for large effects, high uh, odds ratios instead of the situation in common disease where you have small effects or rare s small effects for common variants or large effects for rare variants and in the pharmacogenomics uh, space you have m ample opportunity for large effects for common variants because there's no previous evolutionary selection that's ever occurred for these environmental compounds that we've never seen before as a species. Yeah. So, so I think that that is, has been the wish. 
uh, for pharmacogenomics. The hope is that it would be easier than, than the you know, disease genetics, for example, um, be, because of that. Um, and there are some examples, um, you know, the most dramatic are some of the HLAs with these odds ratios of 2,500 and such. You know, you don't even need a statistician or, a, or genotyping, you just throw it on the wall and there it is. Um, but the, the, um, the reality is that there are many examples coming out now where, you know, have, which, have an, which have an odds ratio of two, and maybe when you add them up and put in some clinical factors, suddenly you get some prediction. So I, I don't think it's going to be a case where uh, pharmacogenetics will have odds ratios of, of 10 and disease genetics will have uh, odds ratios of 1.1. Um, but yeah. the, the other thing is that certainly um, Mary's <laughs> published recently on this, as of others, that there are rare variants that matter. And uh, at least the most recent paper that I know from Mary was with one of the, the um, SLC transporters um, saying that, you know, there were rare variants that did contribute to the effect on methotrexate. Now, there was an effect of some common variants, too, so it wasn't an all or none. But I think that most of the lessons that we're learning from the disease genetics people are being found in pharmacogenetics, um, even though we wished it was going to be uh, simpler. I, I, just someone I, else from the committee? I'll, I'll just say that, that um, for many of the drug response phenotypes, we just don't have the data yet. Well, you know, that's a, you know, I, I uh, presented at the NIH uh, in their, um, I can't remember what your, the, the genetics course was, but what, what it's called, call, but um, last year, and, and before that, did a little analysis of the, the NHGRI GWAS catalog. Um, and it was, it was 4% of the GWASs that had been done at that point had any drug endpoint of it at all. And it was only a minor uh, percentage of those that had had more than 500 patients in the whole thing. Um, and so if you look at a, the, the criteria that we would recognize as being useful for GWAS or other discovery approaches and look at what's in the catalog for pharmacogenetics, there's very little. Now, of the ones that are there, they've had a dramatic impact, I mean, you know, the IL-28B uh, being one of them. Um, but it's, it's almost like pharmacogenetics hasn't really started in, in some ways. Um, of the top 200 drugs, I, I, it's, it's only about, I think it's about 15 of them that it had any pharmacogenetic analysis at all, uh, much less negative or positive. You know, so uh, it's how I'm sure you're working to fix that. And, uh, no, and, it'll be and, Vanderbilt and we are to fix too. it first. <laughs> I, I've, it's probably instructive. So I think as many people in the room know, the eMERGE sites are uh, in the midst of trying to think about um, genetic variants that they would actually measure in, in an experimental way, put back in the electronic health record and test what the implications are for, you know, outcomes or for at least process in terms of that. So at least at North, the Northwestern site, um, we've been very actively engaged with uh, our physicians group that's going to be implementing uh, our genetic variants. It's a general internal medicine crowd that's very engaged and interested in, um, in quality improvement. And it's, it's really interesting to me that overwhelmingly the things that they are excited about doing are pharmacogenomic variants. And the things that they're less interested in doing are disease risk scores, common disease risks with relative, you know, odds ratios of 1.05. But the pharmacogenomic variants, they're, they're quite enthusiastic about. And Dan will appreciate this. We even reached out to some of our interventional cardiologists, and they were very excited about actually doing that's, this. That's because they've heard from their friends at Vanderbilt that it's not going to kill them to do it. But uh, <laughs> the, 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 other, the other piece of the, inter, the, of the implementation stuff that, that we're, we've been thinking about in eMERGE is, is not disease prediction. So nobody, I mean, we, we've heard that this morning already. But, but if you have disease X, you know, what's your outcome likely to be? So if you have hypertension, are there predictors of increased risk for renal failure? If you have diabetes, are there increased prediction for ocular complications? And, and we think that that might have, number one, increased odds ratios, and number two, it might catch the attention of the, of the provider and the patient more than telling some 20-year-old that you're at increased risk based on some genetic marker uh, of type 2 diabetes when you know, they're sort of sitting in your office eating French fries or something. <laughs> I guess I, got, I, guess I gave myself the last um, word. Oh, no. Just one, if I could make a comment to your yes, last one. Um, although um, the increased risk is certainly important, um, the payers will be looking for the next step.
which is does the intervention That's uh, I'm gonna and, write. and paying for extra drug, et cetera, lead to an improved outcome before they'll want to pay for that. Okay. Um, that's a, that's a really important comment. We'll stop there. So uh, we're 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 not really on time, but we're sort of on time. So so we, we'll, let's let's uh, let's have a twenty minute break. We'll come back at ten fifty uh, by the by by the by the clock on my computer, and then we'll have the short uh, updates from Howard Murray and who was the third person, Jeff. and Jeff, uh, and uh, and then we'll get back on schedule, sort of. <laughs>